The Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Chip Nellinger. Chip Nellinger is with Blue Reef Agri-Marketing out of Morton, Illinois. He's nice enough to come on and talk about what's happening in the world of commodities. Chip, how are you doing this morning? Doing well, Casey. How are you doing? Doing good, man. You uh, put your boat away or are you still having to paddle around out there? Oh, yeah. We are uh, we kind of missed, uh, at least in this area, most of the rains. Uh, they had some potential uh, heavy storms and, and hail and wind. and We kind of lucked out last night here in this general area. We kind of missed that. Uh, there were some storms to the north. Looks like we got maybe two or three days of, um, you know, run in here. We did have a lot of activity over this past weekend. Really, the last two weekends, we had a lot of activity. So we've kind of caught up. I'd say we're, um, you know, definitely on the downside of it right here. Northern Illinois, I, I would say, is, you know, 80, 85 percent done with corn and, and probably about the same beans. Looks like the next two or three days will allow some guys to get finished up. So, um you know, we're, it's okay. What is it? 22nd of May here. So, uh, right on time. We're, we're, uh, you know, obviously going to now need regular rain throughout the growing season, but there are isolated pockets around the corn belt that uh, have had too much rain. Obviously a lot of rain in parts of Iowa and Missouri, Northern Illinois and Wisconsin, um, yesterday, uh, afternoon and evening. So 
you know, there's there's pockets that need some drying out and, uh, you know, are definitely behind pace as far as planting goes. Right on. Okay. Yeah, you watch the news and you're starting to see where those really drought-stricken areas were going into playing season now where after we kind of really flipped that script and they're back to being uh, – they're yeah, we really. Be, so. Yeah, if you look at the uh, the drought monitor, it really uh, healed some uh, some areas up. So uh, that's that's good news, right? I mean, yeah. I, that's not something you want right at planting time, uh, obviously. And now our backs against the wall and the windows shutting as far as the the planting window, especially for corn. But um, you know, in the same breath, the, the crop that's in the ground is going to have some really good moisture to get it going and and up and out of the ground. So it'll be it'll be harder, not impossible. But harder to get this, you know, drought talk started. But uh, you know, I mean, the the old saying and the fear is things things even out when you're talking about Mother Nature. So we're we're above above normal on rainfall right now. Um, you know, will that mean we average this out and be below normal rainfall in July and August? That's when it really matters. So that's right. that's well out ahead of us. So there's plenty of time still for weather scares out there. Yep, for sure. All right, let's talk about the. Uh... Probably the biggest hitter we've seen over the last two years has been wheat, especially um, soft red winter wheat and where that plays into the marketplace. We've seen wheat really rally over the last two weeks based on uh, Russian news that we've seen coming out about frost and, and drought and everything else that comes in between there. Right now we've seen um, wheat somewhere around $7.10 a bushel, seven oh seven a bushel. We've seen that rally up from – Six six fifty something last week when it got to seven bucks it rallied uh, took a dive backwards and again kind of on the the news of the um, Kansas Wheat Tour that came out that showed it to be a little better than what people had thought that's arguable because people I talked to didn't sure sure didn't say the same thing that that report <laughs> said but nonetheless but uh, I guess so Chip as you're looking at this you see wheat taking off and running and now you're seeing corn and soybeans coming up with it. December corn right now is about four eighty five, getting pretty close to that five dollar number. Are we going to start hitting some some technical numbers here pretty soon? Some resistance numbers. I think we kind of got past that seven dollar number, but as you're looking at what's out there next, obviously you got to keep feeding the bear here with the with the bad news out of out of Russia. So I guess what's your thought and feel for where this is headed now? Yeah, it, it is all about uh, wheat, and uh, you know it's it's really been a a change of the of the guard, right? Uh, you know, all through the last um, eighteen months, basically, when you whenever you had a, a slightly bullish story in corn, and corn tried to lift its head uh, up off the the mat, um, you know, wheat would just get pummeled, and the funds just kept selling it. It just it seemed like every day. Uh, and now you've you've changed that for sure. And wheat is really the bullish story out here. You mentioned the uh, the dry weather in the Russian growing areas. That extends over into the growing areas of Ukraine. Uh, Russia's had uh, probably five, um, maybe more, but at least five hard freezes on that crop. Uh, and so they're still assessing the damage uh, on what those freezes, um, you know, uh, occurred and, and the yield potential there. And they're going to need some rain over the next three or four weeks in here. And there's just not much in the forecast right now. So you've seen the funds who had a, a massive short position come out of all those shorts uh, they're back probably now after yesterday uh, and um, and Monday, uh, you know, was nearly limit up uh, in wheat, um, probably slightly net long in the wheat market right now. We are starting to hit some objectives up here north of seven. Um, we got up, uh, I just think, just shy or right around 715 in the overnight um, uh, this past uh, evening uh, on uh, the Chicago wheat contract. So, you know, it's all a function of how long the funds want to get now. And so you probably have maybe stretched this thing far enough for the time being, but I think if there's anything that's explosively bullish out here right now, it is wheat. And that's under the uh, assumption that you're going to continue to see cuts in the Russian wheat crop. Russia is the number one exporter uh, of wheat in the world. And so, you know, on top of that, you've got, you know, some little issues around the world. India didn't have a very good crop. They're going to likely need to import some wheat eventually. Australia's had some issues. Uh, the Southern Hemisphere, South America, it's not going great. Uh, you know, you mentioned here uh, the Kansas Wheat Tour did show better than expected yields, but um, still nothing like, um, you know, a, a normal crop out there, but certainly better than um, a year ago uh, when it was so, so hot and dry and, you know, drought stricken uh, in those southern plains. Now, you get parts of Oklahoma and southwestern Kansas 
they're feeling the same, right? They're wondering, right, where's a good crop here? So it's a little bit of a mixed bag uh, in that area, but at least it's going to be lo- what looks like a bigger crop than a year ago. So a uh, lot of explosiveness out there. That doesn't mean that we're going to go straight up because we've hit some, some maybe some uh, near-term technical objectives in wheat with this overnight trade and the big run-up we've had here uh, this week so far. That has undoubtedly helped corn. New crop corn, I believe the high so far has been 496 and a quarter on this last push. Um, from really the mid 490s all the way up to there's a gap in the chart that goes from, I think, 502 and a quarter to like 503 and a quarter uh, in December. Uh, it's going to be massive um, farmer selling offers up really from uh, the, the mid 490s all the way up into the low $5. That likely is going to stop us for the time being. Um, you know, assuming we get the rest of this corn crop planted uh, and we stay on pace, we kind of caught up to the five year average planting pace as far as this past Monday's uh, planting progress goes. So it kind of depends on how the last 30% of the crop goes in the ground here, but it does look like at least some areas in the eastern Corn Belt and, um, you know, kind of the mid-south uh, are going to maybe get a window here to get some some planting finished up. So, you know, I think the change has been, are we going to go straight up? No. Are, are we going to likely have corrections in wheat along the way? Yes. But now you've changed the attitude and the funds, instead of wanting to sell every rally and get short, now we're going to be in let's buy every break and continue to build a long position in the wheat. And I think that they're, um, you know, kind of in the same way. This last USD report uh, on corn coming in with only a 2.1 billion bushel carryout, that was 300 million uh, bushels below kind of what the average was, or at least what the fear was. And now with a little bit of a later planting window, and 181 national average yield out there for trend line. We've never done that. You plug a five-year average um, yield in on corn, on even on 90 million acres, which is a little bit in question. There might be a little bit of prevent plant out there, and we're certainly, um, you know, not at a 2.1 billion bushel carryout. That brings it down into the one five, one six, and that's still with a pretty big crop. So that should give us a little bit of a floor uh, under the corn market. Uh, on breaks. Um, I would tell you, though, the one thing we're watching, you typically put a seasonal high in, uh, you know, sometime between where we're talking right now and about the first uh, week to 10 days of June. So we're in that window where we can normally see kind of your, you know, your your spring high. And oftentimes the market sets back and then reevaluates, you know, how's summer going to go? How's pollination? Are we getting hot and dry anywhere? How's moisture been? Uh, and are we getting very hot um, into uh, pollination and grain fill? So we got plenty ahead of this market uh, that's going to drive us. But we are at an area on the calendar as well as price that kind of makes us uh, take a look and say, hey, um, we need to be probably making some sales out here in the wheat, uh, maybe making some 2025 20, sales. Um, you know, that's well north of, uh, I think, the, the July 25 Chicago wheat. Got up just shy of 750. Pretty good numbers there. And, you know, um, should be looking at some uh, mid to upper 480s or low 490s corn sales here in the short run, um, you know, taking advantage of this rally uh, while we uh, while we still see good prices. Okay. So there's not been that many um, reports out of South America and Brazil, even Argentina at this point, um, that have been anything other than our crops in bad shape. We got a flood in the south. We got drought in the north. We've got, you know, Argentina's got the same situation going. Yet the USDA keeps coming back with, eh, it's not that bad. You know, we're, we're it's going to be okay. So as you, I guess, when does that start? You when do you think those numbers start playing a factor in what we see happening in in uh, in world supply when you start talking about second crop corn out there? Yeah, you know, that's still uh, up in the air, um, Casey. The, the, the second crop corn has seemed to take a little bit of a back seat. You haven't heard much, but for sure the the flooding has affected some some corn acres in that area. That That's an area where they grow some second crop corn. There's, uh, there's other areas that have got a little bit dry, which is normal because that's typically their dry season is right about now. So you haven't heard a lot about that. Um, Conab was out here a couple weeks ago. Uh, and they did continue to cut their their bean and corn crops well under where the USDA is. I think maybe that the market is is trading somewhere under what the USDA has projected. 
And and the answer probably is somewhere in the middle, right, between where Conab is and where the USDA is. And I think that's probably where the market's trading. So, you know, on the one hand, we, we may already kind of be reflecting that. Um, Co- now, Conab came out uh, there a couple weeks back, and they did cut their, their crop just a little bit, but it was somewhat offset by an increase in their, in their um, harvested acres down there on beans. And so that's the real uh, elephant in the room, so to speak, is that they just continue to expand their acres down there every year. There's more waiting in the wings uh, when they get to their their spring planting here, which would be um, uh, you know our winter, their spring. Um, they're likely going to expand acreage again down there. So um, in the short run, you know I think that that some of the the crop losses off of the best projections are probably starting to be in the market with this move higher that we've seen. Um, so, you know, I do think that that's something that uh, has has affected us and maybe pushed some of these funds out of some of their short positions as you've seen this big transfer of ownership. Um, you know, funds buying it, farmers selling it. Uh, it's been a, a, you know, a wild ride here the last uh, two or three weeks. Right on. Okay, let's jump over and talk a little bit about what's happening in the um, proteins over here. If you take a look at the at beef margins, they're just beef just has, keeps fueling the fire. I mean, you would think we've had all this recession talk and all the things that we've seen happening, and just beef just keeps banging through that. So, I guess looking at the beef market now, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, it is a it is a, a head scratcher that the consumer has been able to hold this thing together. Now, some of this has been the effect of um, manipulation comes to mind. I don't, I don't want to give it too harsh of a context uh, about some uh, slowing kills by the Packers, right, to try to regain margin. And it has helped them a little bit. So they've slowed the kills down a little bit. Uh, it's jacked the box beef prices up a little bit. They've been having to pay up for cattle the last few weeks in a row here. And so the, the, uh, the live cattle futures have rallied. Uh, feeder cattle futures have rallied. Box beef has rallied, but the fear here is um, that because the packers have slowed the kills down a little bit, that maybe we're going to back cattle up a little bit and there'll be a little bit of a of an overhang in this market. We'll, we'll wait to see on that, but at least here in the short run, we've seen a nice rally um, in, in live cattle and feeders. The funds have been there on the long side as well, kind of rebuilding some long positions. Hopefully we're getting the bird flu issue, um, you know, in the in the in the rear view mirror here uh, although there are a couple um you know stories that popped up here about some um uh, what i think it was some uh some hogs that got uh bird flu uh so the, the stories don't seem to go away but at least uh for the last two or three weeks the fun seemed to have uh, forgotten about it for a minute and wanting to get uh, back on the long side of the cattle complex so um you know whether we can hold that together into summer Remains to be seen. Uh, certainly have some good weather ahead of us, or some potential good weather to to increase demand. You haven't seen that spill over into the into the hog side. Hogs have struggled a little bit here. We really should be kind of seeing that demand pick back up. But uh, some of the pork product markets have been a little bit of a struggle in here. So it's been kind of a, the opposite, um, you know, of what you're seeing on the beef side in the in the pork and hog side here. And it's uh, hog markets really kind of struggling here. And we should be in a in a time frame where the wind's at our backs for some uh, some upside here on demand and, you know, the prime grilling season going into summer, but it hasn't translated yet on a rally uh, in the futures on hogs. Right on. Hogs are just, god dang, they get a chance, a little air, a little wind in their cells, and then it just gets right back to where it was. Yeah, they had a they had a run there in the summer months. Um, you know, what I, I think north of 102. Yeah. So historically, those are pretty good levels, but right. you know they 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 broke pretty hard off of uh, off of those highs uh, pretty early. I mean, we shouldn't be putting highs in until uh, you know June July out ahead of us here six or eight weeks. But um, you know, looks so far like we put a temporary high in in, in April, which is a little bit unusual. Let's jump over and talk a little bit about energy real quick, Chip, and we'll wrap it up. As you're looking at, we're headed into that oil um, uh, driving season here for the summer. Um, oil prices are uh, kind of kind of hovering around uh, that upper 80s, lower 90s uh, range. And um, I, I guess as you're looking at that, Chip, 
there doesn't seem like there's a, a lot of, it just seems like oil's just been kind of stuck in these ranges, right? It was either stuck in the 60s for a while, then it was stuck in the 70s, now it's stuck in the 80s. Now it looks like it's back down in the 70s. But I guess as you're looking at, at how those things are playing together, I mean, what are your thoughts there? And, and it just doesn't seem like there's a lot of action in oil right now that's it just kind of bounces around. Yeah, it, it, it is. We're, we're, we're sloppy, um, sloppy action here. I think the market's a little bit confused. Um, you know, you got OPEC that is uh, held together pretty well with, uh, with um, you know, kind of holding together some production cuts here over the last year. Um, I think the market on breaks when it feels heavy and gets down into the, into the mid seventies, you've the last couple times that's happened. Um, you know, in hindsight, we learned that, uh, we're, we're refilling, we're buying oil, uh, to refill the strategic reserve. Uh, so the market knows that, Hey, if we get into the low to mid seventies, it looks like the, the, the U S government's backstopping us here by being a big buyer. So we can buy it if it gets down there, uh, but it hasn't uh, had the spark to go rally north of 80. And now you have news yesterday that, uh, in all our infinite wisdom, we're going to uh, sell out uh, the uh, you know gasoline stocks that we have in the Northeast um, to keep prices uh, low for uh, that key Memorial Day to July 4th uh, holiday period. There, uh, we're not going to worry about uh, any storms or national disasters or uh, anything like that where we might need those stocks uh, we're going to try to keep uh, keep gas prices uh, low going into an election season so um you know so you got that that's kind of confusing the market like we're we're selling gasoline but we're buying crude oil and uh, you know nobody knows what to make uh, of all this nonsense uh in the market right now and you lack a spark right i think with all the uncertainty in um in, in israel and gaza in Iran, you know, their president just died in a uh, helicopter accident uh, and the instability we have there and the lack of leadership the United States gives in that region um, that you probably are not going to have a sustained push lower uh, in energies with all that news. But yet in the same breath, we don't have the real spark to go pushing us north of 80. So I think in, until there's more clarity there, you just continue to slop a little bit here. Um, and, and, but I think, I do think if we start pushing, um, lower into the low seventies or get into the upper sixties, probably not a real good sign overall, um, for the economy, the stock market at all time highs tells you everything's perfect, right? Like economy's great. Everything's great, but there's some things happening, um, below the surface. And I would take crude oil uh, as number one, right? If this economy is so good, um, we ought to keep uh, crude oil, you know, up near 80 or above 80. If you start dipping in the low 70s or upper 60s, I think that's maybe a, a big warning sign that something's starting to, uh, the gears are starting to seize up a little bit in, in not only the U.S. economy, but the world economy. So I think it's something to really keep a close eye on here over the next two or three months, um, you know, as it relates to maybe the health of the overall economy, too. Right on. All right, Chip, good place to stop. Folks want to reach out to you and get more information about what it is you're doing over at Blue Reef Agri-Marketing. What's the best way to do that? Yeah, best way is just call our office, uh, and that number is 309-550-7213. Love to, love to chat with you about uh, your risk management plan and uh, maybe executing uh, you know, better on that, especially when it's busy and uh, you know high time to plant, spray, and, and, uh, and farm. Uh, the, the market's become a secondary thought, but uh, really they should be front and center right now. Absolutely. Chip, appreciate you being on the podcast, man. We'll try to catch you next week. All right. Thanks for having me on, Casey. Right on. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast and check out the video version over on the YouTube channel, which is the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. Go to TikTok while you still can and see uh, what we have posted up there at Moving Iron Podcast as well. So, Go to Moving Iron LLC for everything Moving Iron related, and you get all the information there. If you're interested in helping improve what you got going on at your dealership, give me a shout. I got a little consulting company. We can help you figure out your sales processes, user equipment processes, and your parts and service processes as well. So if you're interested in that, send me an email at Moving Iron Podcast at Moving Iron and I'll make sure to get back to you. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour, Chip Nellinger. Let's move some iron folks out. Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors.
Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately, target the right buyers and close more deals, reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment, but nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is proudly provided by Axon, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. Find out more at axontire.com. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century.